Thanks everybody for coming to my first virtual presentation. Uh, normally I do these in person, uh, transportation camps all over the place, but I, I appreciate that you want to hear this stuff from me. So the reason I decided to do this presentation was that at many different transportation camps, I've seen similar presentations for advocates about kind of how to craft your arguments and what to say and do, but never from the perspective of the person who's getting talked to. So since I am a former bureaucrat myself, I thought it might be helpful to talk to people about the techniques that worked on me and the techniques that did not work on me. Um, so my former bureaucrat life was spent with about 10 years at the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, um, which regulates all four higher transportation in New York City. It's one of the largest markets in the world, and over a million people a day use those regulated industries. Um, and feel free to add me, connect to me, contact me, what have you. Um, so the first thing I want to make sure that people understand is that policies are not handed down from on high. They are created by people. And because they're created by people, you have to influence people if you want anything to get done. So no matter how big and faceless a government agency looks, they are just composed of people like you and me with emotions and bosses and rivals and beliefs that really shape how they see the world. Um, so you need to get inside their heads a little bit to get anything done. One thing that frequently didn't work on me when I was a bureaucrat with some degree of control over policy is people who would show up and try and threaten or demand things of me. Um, that never worked because they lacked the power to punish me in any way. I couldn't be voted out of office. They couldn't hire me. They couldn't fire me. They couldn't reduce my budget. They lacked any levers to do anything to get me to do anything. So thinking about what those actual levers are and how they can be used are really important. And also something that is seen frequently in the kind of very online Twitter verses, this idea that people in government or people at agencies are all corrupt and they just do things because they get money. 99% um, of the people I have worked with in my career are not corrupt, are not doing things for cash payments. They're doing things because they have beliefs and they have a worldview. And so if you want to change that worldview, starting off by saying, hey, you're a crook is usually not that persuasive. If you want big policy changes in your community, you got to work with the system that we have. Um, doing a revolution is expensive and time consuming and requires a lot of guns. Um, not the transit way of doing things. What you really want to do is get the agency or government on your side. You want them to listen to you and say, I like what that person has to say. And you want to make it easy for them to give you what you want. Um, frequently people would approach me and ask for things that were not within my power to give or really, really heavy lifts for me to do. I had to say no. I only had so much time during the day. I only have so much energy. I only have so much clout within my own agency. The people who asked me to do things that were easy or wouldn't cause a lot of trouble, I would hand that out like candy at Halloween. So you need to show people that you can make the advocate happy without annoying everybody else, which is, I think, a concept that a lot of people who approached me did not internalize, that they are not the only constituency. So even if you know you're right and you know what you're doing is on the side of the angels, there are other people who have the bureaucrat's ear. So I thought I'd kind of give an example of how to handle something that happens very frequently, a public meeting, and four strategies that we can talk about that work pretty well at public meetings to get what you want. And so let's use SEPTA, um, because our hosts are Philadelphia, as the example agency. So they've called a hearing on something that you really care passionately about. It's either a really important issue to you or affects your life directly. How should we approach this issue? So strategy number one that I would suggest is using written testimony strategically. Um, every lobbyist I've ever dealt with in my entire career always, always has a detailed letter ready to hand me with bullet points and explanations about exactly what they want me to do. And it's shocking to me how many activists and lobbyists um, who come from more of the activism side of things don't do this simple step. Um, there are a lot of advantages to writing things down and presenting something ahead of the talk. Number one, you can circulate in advance. So all the board members and people within the agency can see it and know what to expect when you actually show up at the meeting. The other advantage is that you can go into a lot more detail in a letter or a short presentation. And by letter, I mean no more than five pages because you don't want to hand people a book. Um, but frequently, especially with 
with in-person meetings that are very popular, testimony is usually limited to a couple of minutes at best. You can't cram in everything you want or need to say into two or three minutes, especially when you're being hustled in and out. If you've ever been to a big public meeting where there's 100 people lined up to speak, and that's happened, um, you're not going to be able to say very much. The other advantage is that you can hand exactly what you're handing to the agency to press, or you can post it online, so everyone sees the same thing and knows exactly what you're about. The second strategy I want to go into is you really need to... Hey, Dave. Yep. Sorry to jump in. I don't know if you're sharing your screen right now. We only see your screensaver. Oh, I am sharing my screen. And okay. I don't have my screensaver. Give me a minute. What I'm going to do is turn my screensaver off because it's cool, but you probably don't want to see it. Sorry, it looks like we can see your desktop, but I'm... Mm -hmm. But, because we can see your cursor now, so I don't know if it's presenting on, an, if it's trying to present on another screen. You know, I went, I went full screen, and maybe that's causing a problem. Let me just make it big, and you can just look at my screen. Can you see it now? Can people see my desktop? Still, we, it's still the desktop, unfortunately. But can you see can you see the slide on my desktop? No. Okay, something's wrong because it's not giving you a live shot on my desktop. Uh, if I'm wondering if I've actually never used this software before, I'm wondering if it's some of the some of these web tools require like they give you the option to only show certain things like the desktop or specific windows okay. to. That's what button. I did. I said desktop. I wonder if that blocks yeah, out. Yeah, so then it's probably only going to show you the desktop then. Might need oh, to so you're literally just seeing the desktop. Yeah. Okay. Give yeah. Me, give, me, give me one minute. Um, I'm going to try logging out and logging in again, and then I will give permissions. Let's try that again. Okay. Okay, let's do it. Thanks for catching that, Corey. I uh, I saw the I saw the desktop, and I assumed that the presentation was maybe he was just waiting for his 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 presentation to ramp up, and it was going to be a big point. And <laughs> <laughs> I can I can go through it without the presentation. This is not my first rodeo here. Um, I can I can just talk, and and you can just look at me if that works better. It's uh, and I can email this to everyone who. Oh, wait a minute. How about now? Yes, that's working. All right. <laughs> yes, we All can right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so can everyone see the public hearing slide? Yeah. 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 All right. Yep. So we did written testimony. Well, let me let me go through real quick first so you can see my pretty pictures. This is me and how to get in touch with me if you have follow-up questions or issues or, you know, just want to harsh me on Twitter or whatever. Um, but yeah, let's talk about a, a public meeting. Um, so yeah, so written testimony, and I didn't read the bullets exactly, um, but close enough. And then, so the second issue is, the meeting is too late to start talking about things, right? So one thing to realize about any kind of government agency is that they already did a whip count before they called the public meeting. Um, they already know how the vote's going to go. You are not going to persuade them at the meeting with some passionate speech out of Footloose about how dancing is right, and all of a sudden they'll all change their minds. They already know how the vote goes. Um, so waiting for the meeting to make your persuasive case is way too late. I've been to, with just the Taxi and Limousine Commission, something like three or four dozen public meetings where an important vote was taking place. At exactly one of them, something happened at the meeting to make everybody go, hey, wait a minute, we can't take the vote today. Um, usually the only reason a vote is taken is because maybe they lose quorum or someone can't show up for the meeting, but you can't rely on that. You need to move as an advocate as soon as the meeting is announced. Um, that's when you have the opportunity to make your case and start talking to people. Um, not every board member will necessarily have a fixed opinion on an issue, especially if it's something new that's come up that's kind of outside their wheelhouse, that is your opportunity to lobby. Saying, hey, we're going to save our powder and show up in force at the meeting does not move votes. It just doesn't. I've never seen a vote move that way. Um, 
you can you can show up with a surprising number of people and maybe you can show up with press if you're really skilled but again if you're someone like Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell where there's real stakes you don't even call for a vote until you know what the count is you don't even bother so don't wait for the meeting the third strategy is to think more about structural change and that structural change gets you even more structural change one thing I've noticed a lot when I was lobbied by advocates is that they cared a lot about the vote but they never offered a strategy for who gets on the board and I think this is backwards um, if you can get a supporter of your constituency on the board or whoever makes the decisions that's like winning hundreds if not thousands of individual votes you need to focus more on winning the war not on an individual battle and also you need to realize that some people are on the board specifically to stop you they're there to say no to you so trying to persuade them through a speech or kind of your great logical argument will never work because they don't actually represent anyone who's responsible to you and again I think I'll use SEPTA as our example because it's a really perfect example of this so let's look at who's actually on the SEPTA board that makes decisions the suburban counties that surround Philadelphia Delaware County Montgomery County Bucks County and so on get eight seats on the board two in each county the governor appoints one person the Senate state Senate appoints two seats one majority one minority the same in the house and the city of Philadelphia itself only gets two seats so you have a permanent supermajority on the board that primarily serves core Philadelphia the city itself um, to stop Philadelphia from doing things and at times kind of before 2016 suburban counties were largely Republican so you basically had a Republican supermajority governing the transit system of a city that voted 85 percent for Hillary Clinton the system is not set up to help you um, thinking about redoing how the board works is something that's really 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 worth your time how different would SEPTA's policies look if Philadelphia had half the seats or a majority of the seats that's a really big change and really worth your time the fourth basic strategy I like to suggest to people is to always find people inside the agency um, the party line for an agency what they officially say comes from someone like a commissioner or a president or a mayor or a governor someone very high up who is not involved with line work who is not involved with operations that was made outside the agency that decision but every large organization has people like you in it so some place like SEPTA or the MTA or Caltrans has lots of people who are very progressive and want to do what you want to do they may not just be in power at the moment you need to do everything you can to find who these people are talk to them and constantly give them data they need to be on your mailing list you need to really talk to them all the time bounce ideas off them tell them what you're doing if they like what you're doing give them free memberships to your organization build a constituency inside the agency because the analyst of today is the director of tomorrow and this is something I've also found that people don't think about I'll give an example I had an intern when I worked at TLC now he's a very senior advisor to the Commissioner for Homeless Services in New York City if you had met him and cultivated him when he was my intern you would have known him for 10 years now when you ask him for a favor he knows who you are he understands who you are and what you're about he agrees with you and now he has power to do something about it transportation camp is a great way to meet lots of people at junior levels at large organizations and at agencies who have long careers in this industry and five years from now ten years from now they'll have positions of power wouldn't it be great if they already knew you and they knew what you were doing the people who are in those positions of power right now did not come up with you you're a stranger to them it's much harder to persuade them to do what you want to do um, Andy Byford gave a great speech at New York transportation camp two years ago he said amazing things he's gone he got two years and that's it he had a fight with Governor Cuomo and it's over but the long-term staff at New York City Transit and the MTA the people who make careers out of this and stay at the agency for a long time are the people who decide whether the reforms will keep going or not who's working on train speeds today if you had been talking to them the last three years you'd know who they are you know what they're doing and you have influence with them and those are the four basic principles that I wanted to go over and I wanted to carve out some time for you guys to talk about 
What are some strategies that you've used? Have you tried these ideas? What are some roadblocks you run into? And if I can tell you any war stories from my own experience, um, as a senior policy person, I'm happy to answer any questions. And that's it for the presentation. Oh, I see Patty has a comment. Uh, I'm going to read it out loud because I think it's a very good point. Um, so the Commonwealth is not just Philadelphia. True, ridership is regional in the five-county region. That is true. Um, especially Philadelphia has a very strong regional rail system. But what are the ridership amounts of Philadelphia's bus system versus regional rail? Or the L plus the bus system versus regional rail? If you're allocating resources based on ridership, why do suburban counties have the majority of the seats on the board? Um, there's other ways to structure it. There's no labor seat on the board. There's no rider seat on the board. There's no advocate seat on the board. There's no operations seat on the board. Uh, I'll give an example from my own experience, which is um, in the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, 95% um, of all rides happen in Manhattan and Brooklyn. But Staten Island, which represents less than a percent of all rides, gets a seat on the board. So Staten Island is a veto point for things that affect everyone else in the city. Um, the reason they're there to do that is to stop you from doing things. Um, it's not really an equity issue. It's a roadblock issue. Um, <laughs> so thinking about these issues is a, is a really good way to, to do that. Oh, it looks like I'm transitioning out of presentation mode back into chat. I have, a, I have a spinning wheel here. Um, so yeah, so shout out if you have questions, issues. Um, thank you to the people who are giving me kudos on the uh, on the chat. Um, but but speak up. Uh, we can all see and hear each other, and, and you'd be yelling at me if we were all in person. That's the way I like to do it. Can I can I jump in here? This is Regina with Federal Highway. I think this was very um, on point. Excellent um, advice. What what things usually uh, drew you to support them? What was it an emotional plea? Was it uh, an economic substance behind? What what are the things that would make you want to move to act other than being simple and within your power? Um, I, I wouldn't us underestimate simple and in my power. And I'll use a, a great example that I, that I think people here can relate to. So one of the projects that I was responsible for was called Taxi of Tomorrow, where the city partnered with an auto manufacturer to custom build a vehicle for the taxi duty cycle in New York. And one of the constituent groups we had to please was transportation alternatives, which I assume everyone here is familiar with. They're a very um, potent bicycling and kind of safer streets, vision zero advocacy organization. Um, and we got them to endorse a car. And here's how we got them to do it, is that they absolutely attacked through the frame of what do you have the power to do? So for example, one of the things that they asked for was, if you're going to introduce this new vehicle into the city, can you reduce the size from what's being done now? And can you also add some benefits for other users of the streets? Is there something about this vehicle that's going to help pedestrians or help bicyclists? Um, which is a, an interesting request. Um, and it turns out that because of the partner we chose and the vehicle we chose, it kind of came with the package. Um, when we asked Nissan, can you do that stuff, they said, oh, yeah, the platform we chose for this, for example, has sliding doors. So bicycle doorings was a really big concern of transportation alternatives. Um, Really easy way for me as a bureaucrat to get some kudos from an organization that fights me a lot is to just give them stuff to get them off my back. So part of the way to think about it is that by being pesky for a while, they became a constituent group that I needed to please, but nine times out of ten, I couldn't do anything for them. So the one time I could do something for them, I was like jumping at it. I'm like, yes, absolutely. You can, you can have all the stuff you want. It's there. Um, because I needed more allies to help me pass the project through the board. Um, another example was there's an organization that advocates for taxi drivers, the Taxi Workers Alliance. They usually looks at things through a, a labor frame. I needed to please them as well. They asked for actual changes to the vehicle, but they were all within the possibility of the engineering that I was working with. Yes, yes, yes. I'm just going to give it away, give it away, because any time I can get allies, especially from people who normally are hostile, is good. So I think, I think the emotion to go for is not necessarily, I'll tell you what never worked, and, and this will sound really cruel, but you know the, the think of a children, think of all the dead people argument actually never really worked um, because it's 
it sounded to us like a variant of the you're all taking bribes, right? Like the like the only reason you're doing this is because you get bribed is really insulting and putting yourself in someone else's shoes and saying, you know, what does it sound like to say like you don't care about dead kids? I'm a parent. That that's a really hostile way to frame an argument with Nick. But coming in and reframing it and saying, look, you care about kids. I care about kids. Um, maybe we can do something together to make an improvement is a much warmer emotional argument. So even, even using that emotion frame, there's different ways to do it. But I would say, I would say 99% of the time that really hostile, um, you suck, you're only doing this because you're a bad person, never, ever, ever, ever worked. And it would never work on you. Like if I, if I was going to flip it and go to a bicycle advocate and go, you know, try and go like, oh, you know, you just like to run over grannies on the sidewalk with your bike, you'd flip out, right? Like you'd say, that's, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. Of course not. Like I like active transit. It doesn't pollute. It's great. But that's the frame being used by your enemy. So I would say, I would say emotional appeals will work if you frame the emotion the correct way. Um, but data, data, data is always number one because it's really hard to argue against facts. So if you show up and say, you know, hey, it's really important to put a bike rack, for example, on every bus is an argument that's really winning for a lot of transit agencies because it's cheap. It doesn't cost a lot to retrofit all the buses. It's easy. It doesn't require advanced training or some kind of weird RFP to do. Lots of people use it, so there's not that it's just going to sit there and not do anything, and it's best practices everywhere else. So making those arguments are a really good strategic way to, to look at things. Great question. Can I follow up? That was excellent. Um, can I follow up with how, how do you get a seat at the table if you're just kind of a regular person? What's your best way to start getting um, that influence? Like, how, I agree with your approaches and the kind of the win-win, but like, how do you first get yourself in the door? Well, I think that's why find inside allies is your strongest move because everyone says, I want to have lunch with the chairman or I want to have a meeting with the decision maker. And that person is busy and has a lot of constituents to talk to. But the, you know, the analyst in policy doesn't get invited out to lunch very often. And maybe they're a member of Young Professionals in Transportation and you met them at a happy hour. They love getting invited to stuff because they do not get invited to those advocacy meetings. Um, either their boss thinks they're too junior to do it or what have you, but they're the easiest people to convince, right? So if, you know, and again, in my agency, people who made friends with the people who actually, the junior level people who actually showed up to do on the street work, all of a sudden had advocates telling the directors and their bosses, why don't we invite Joe Blow? They seem to know a lot about the topic. Um, one thing we started when I ran the policy department was brown bag lunches, where we'd invite subject matter experts. So an advocate can be a subject matter expert. We don't know anything about bicycles and Vision Zero. Can we get someone to come in? Great. So-and-so from Transportation Alternatives knows a lot about that. They're not looking for an honorarium. Can they come in and just have lunch with us? And then just invite anyone who wants to come in the agency. And that works in a big or a small place, right? Like, I've been to meetings at Federal DOT. That's a monster organization. That's a huge building, right? But saying, posting signs that say, hey, we're having a, like a quasi-happy hour, or, hey, lunch with the expert, is a great way to get people. And maybe the senior person will drop by or maybe they won't, but it allows you as an advocate to incorporate a lot of your key talking points into the way of thinking. Kind of the other great thing about junior analysts is, and if you're a junior analyst, this is the part where you cover your ears, guys, if you're on this conversation, is that a lot of your ideas have not been fully formed yet. You're new. You're learning about how all the system works. And so an advocate who comes to you and says, I'm going to help teach you about how this works, is going to have an influence on how you view the world. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. If the advocate is honest, they're presenting factual information, they're a resource. They're a tool you can go to to say, hey, I'm trying to do X, Y, or Z. This person's an expert. It's not my background. I'll bring them in. And that's a way, again, to build that influence. There are people I talk to now. Um, I mean, I started out fairly senior at my organization, but I moved up, right? People move up in their careers. Um, Reaching out and not always monofocusing on, well, I'm, I just want to talk to the top person. Um, think of it at the White House. Like, like, yeah, you can get a meeting with Donald Trump, but it's better to go on Fox and Friends. 
Um, it's better it's better to be the influence of the influencer rather than just try and persuade the, the top person all the time because they also have a, a huge bullshit detector and their job is to say no to advocates all the time. They, they don't make a lot of friends by saying yes. These are really good questions. All right. Any, anybody else got uh, two cents on this or? Um, hey, David. Yeah. So I actually I wanted to ask you a question from the perspective of a junior analyst and that how can a junior analyst actually influence policy? Because as junior analysts, like we are passionate and we, we are just out of school and we have all these ideas that we learn in the school and stuff like that. But then you kind of, as you said, you know, like we don't know how the system works and stuff like that. How does a junior analyst kind of get to know the system and, you know, navigate it better? That's a, that's a great question. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you, um, I take a very strong mentorship perspective. I don't really believe in like interns and juniors. You're either on my team or you're not on my team. So um, finding a great mentor or boss is always good, but a lot of people have crappy bosses and can't do anything about it. Um, I would say you have more power than you think as a junior person at a large organization because you are the person who has to do the grunt work. And grunt work is really powerful because you are the person who's actually building the model, right? Um, in many cases, you are the person who's constructing the data set because maybe the data set isn't pre-made already. You're the person who's being told, go and find out about this. And that's an excellent way to learn how it works in the real world and the system. And you're also learning about the system within your own organization because now you see how the argument gets made. So I would say one way to gain influence is actually to volunteer for a lot of that data grunt work. Data is power because how the data is being presented tells a story. And if you have the influence to tell how that story is being told, that's the frame for the rest of the organization. It's really hard for more senior people to say X and Y is true if they don't have data. But if you're the one putting the data together, and I'm not saying put your thumb on the data, I'm not saying make fraudulent data. What I'm saying, though, is you're the person who's constructing how the data is being applied. And I think a lot of people think that the way to have influence in policy is to be, you know, like in Hamilton, the person in the room where it happens. Um, but the people in the room where it happens are reading your report. They're reading your Excel spreadsheet. They're looking at your analytics. What are your analytics saying about it? And that's, and that's why I suggest for advocates cultivating those junior people and presenting them with as much data as possible. If it's really hard to get one form of data and really easy to get another form of data, the easy, the easy data will be incorporated into your models. And that's frequently what we did. Um, frequently, my juniors would come to me and say, hey, I found something really interesting in the data. Do you want to take a look at that? And I'm like, yeah, show me. And they would make, a, make an argument. And I would put that in the back of my head. And you never know when it pops up. Sometimes it wouldn't be useful. But other times, there'd be a meeting, or I'd be in a very senior meeting. And I'd say, uh, guys, did you know x, y, and z? I only knew that because my junior came to me and said, I found something. So spending extra time combing through the data, looking for relationships, looking for things that other people have missed is not just a great way to get a promotion, it's a great way to get more influence in your organization because you then become the expert. And being an internal expert in something makes you way more valuable. That's amazing, thank you. Sure. Hi, this is Nina. I'd like to jump in on that since um, I've worked internally in government as a systems analyst for 12 years and uh, I think all of those points are great and stuff that I've had to learn as I moved uh, through my career as an analyst um, and like I was lucky to have uh, good bosses that would listen to me even though like I was kind of insecure about presenting anything but it got to a point where when I did see kind of this like synergy like oh here's a great opportunity we could really benefit from it like what I ended up doing was putting together a proposal with my understanding of what my boss's needs and wants were and what would drive them and then presenting that proposal to them and trying to convince them in that way and sometimes like I'd be off the mark with like what I thought would be motivating to them didn't line up with like how they needed to respond to their executive or what they needed to consider. But like by doing that and getting that experience, 
you can start to get an idea of what is driving these people, how to frame your argument and present it in a way that addresses those needs and makes it easy for them to be like, oh yeah, that's a great idea, we should do this. And I have actually managed to convince my bosses who like were originally opposed uh, to this one idea and I managed to convince them to sign on to my um, proposal because of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 about it's about whittling away. It's not about having that one grand idea that changes everything. That's just for the movies. It's it's really it's really about consistently doing it. And I think I think your point about it took you some time to learn what arguments work on your your bosses and their superiors is is incredibly valid one. Like you, you just don't know what motivates them. And, and the great thing about being more junior is you get some time to try. Right, like you try A, you try B, you try C, and you kind of see like you can you can do your own A B experiments. Like you know, I one before before I went to grad school, I spent a lot of time career wise as an assistant to people. And the first question I was always ask a new boss was, how do you like your information presented? Are you a memo person? Are you a PowerPoint person? Do you want me to just come in and tell you? Do you want to talk on the phone? Like what works for you? Everybody's different. Um, you know, like I'm a visual thinker. I love charts. You, you show up with like a graph or a chart. I'm super excited. Other people want to see the actual raw data themselves. Like learning that argument is so important. And and that's again, being the guy who actually has to put together the presentation gives you the ability to experiment quite a bit and kind of kind of figure that out. Yeah, those are those are terrific points. Hey David, this is Jaime from the MBTA. Uh, I also want to throw in something on that. Uh, so, for if you're going to make a career out, out of this, um, you know, one of the I think the key pieces of advice I can share is to get out of your silo. Um, you know, uh, if you're uh, in operations, go, to go take a job in the on the capital side. If you're on the capital side, go talk to the environmental team, right? Uh, if you become fluent in another language that is used in your agency, um, you will become the person that everyone goes to from your team when they need to know something about that. Um, and that makes you pretty essential. And that that uh, will help kind of build your repertoire. Um, if you know what the environmental team is looking for, um, you can, you can uh, help out 90% of the rest of the company uh, because they aren't going to know that uh, that information. Yeah, I one thousand percent endorse that. That that is. I wish I had put that as strategy number five, but uh, sorry, sorry, Jaime, I'm going to steal your idea for next time. But uh, yeah, no, that's that's absolutely right. Like like you know, just like there's management by walking around, there's kind of analytics by walking around. And and yes, the best people in the policy department were the people who took the time to actually go out to the field offices and talk to the line workers and go, operationally, how do we do this? How does this actually happen? Like, once the policy is decided, how do they actually put stuff out into the real world? And if you know that, especially if your boss doesn't, um, that also is real power to do things. T titles are just titles. Just because someone has a title doesn't mean they know what they're doing and they actually have any influence or power. Um, knowledge is power. Knowing how things work is power. Um, those are all things that can be leveraged into, into getting more of what you want out of the system. Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing point. Yeah, I just want to say something. Um, I, 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 I'm an architect, and we work. Um, we do transit architecture, and we do a lot of projects with SEPTA. Um, but that being said, I can't really go to a public meeting and start advocating for one thing or the other because then it seems like my company's advocating for it when that may not be the case and they might, might look bad on us. But um, in terms of getting small scale things that are, they might be a little innovative or might not even be uh, on the radar of some things. Um, like you were talking about the bike rack on the bus, it's small, it's inexpensive, relatively speaking. Um, one thing that, people in my, in my position kind of can do is that like um, I'm going to use the example of the bike channels on the stairs to get down into the subways or up onto the L's. If we're doing a project and we have some sort of scope at the stair, like maybe we're replacing the handrails, 
even if it's not explicitly part of the scope, you can come in and say, hey, at this other station, I know that they did, they put bike channels in when they replaced the handrails. Are we doing that here? And then even if you're not, that gets the question out there and it's a way to just start the conversation. I like, hey, if we're not, how come we're not? And you might say, well, is it the best practice? Is it something that we should be doing, should be looking at? So it's another way to kind of get your, you know, get your point out there without circumventing, you know, the best uh, interests of your company, essentially. Um, yeah, yeah ab- ab- absolutely. And, I, and I'll say, uh, I'll share, uh, I went out to Transportation Camp LA last year, which, you know, junk it to LA, why not? Um, well, one of the best presentations I saw there was from a bunch of grad students, and their issue was um, shade in Southern California is a really big issue. So they want bus stops to have more shade, but there really isn't anything in LA Metro's budget to do, like, you know, grandiose plans. So they developed a way to kind of buy some stuff at Home Depot and for 50 bucks put together a tarp that you can put over bus, sh- bus stops to provide some shelter. And that kind of kind of guerrilla action, or even if you're working for a large company and, and, you know, I'm not officially speaking for AECOM, but hey, I have this side project I do on weekends and I blog about it, right, or I tweet about it, um, is a great way to get influence and attention because everybody's interested in seeing cool stuff that people do, even if it's a YouTube video, a TikTok, whatever. Um, And you can say right up front, like, this isn't officially from my agency or my company, I just think this is cool. Um, jealousy is a motivating factor for humans. Um, you know, speaking as a, someone very experienced in New York City government, the best way to get New York City to do something is to point out that other smaller cities are doing it and New York can't. Um, going like, hey, how come Philadelphia has this but New York doesn't, enrages them. They flip out and all of a sudden go, why, why, why does this inferior city have this thing and we don't? Um, Other cities can be motivated by that, and that works for the organizations, too. So kind of saying, like, hey, I figured out this great thing, and, like, I sell it on the weekends, or I do it, or I have a club or a meetup that does this, or you could do it through an existing organization, um, you know, women in transportation, young professionals in transportation, um, is a a great way to do it. I think that's a a great point, And, and I like the fact that you brought up the issue of bike channels, which is another example of something doable, right? Like, you're not, you're not adding a billion dollars to the station budget by putting a little modification of how you're doing concrete on a staircase. It may add nothing or it's marginal. And so, little by little, you can add those things up to something that's a bigger project. And I, and I think that's the, um, the other strategy five that kind of got cut for time, which is abandon an all or nothing perspective. Um, Go, always go for like a lot of marginal changes in a row, and eventually, before you know it, um, you know, in politics, the term is shifting the Overton window, right? Like you, you keep asking for more and more progressive stuff, and all of a sudden, it's super mainstream, right? It's the same way. You say, all right, like station design, like okay, there should be bus bulbs, okay, there should be bike channels, okay, now there should be bike lockers. But if you go in and say this needs to be completely redesigned at a cost of $50 million, it gives people a lot of reasons to say no. And, I, and again, if you're, if you're going to that argument, it's really easy to make you happy. No and it's easy to do, and, and it makes you go away without, without too much extra effort. I'm happy to keep talking, but I don't want to keep you guys from other sessions. Hey everyone, we have a couple minutes left uh, before the next session. Does anyone have any final questions for David? We don't have enough evidence, but we have some evidence. I think we have significant. Is anyone else talking that's not in our chat? <laughs> Maybe. Oh. I just wanted to throw out there, all this stuff has been great. I, you, you could literally do this as, you know, you should teach a course in it. but. Um, a lot of this stuff, it sounds great, it's hard to do, and you got to practice at it. And I just want to throw out there how I got my skills up in this area is through volunteering. I've been, I've been a member of the Planning Commission, Stormwater Advisory Committee, and I highly uh, encourage, if you have the time and the ability to do so, to get in, into one of those types of roles just to hone these skills on, you know, 
partnering and all this other stuff that we're talking about. It, it all, you know, it takes time to get get it together. So thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you everybody for coming and listening to me talk about this. Uh, you know, email me, let me know if you want a copy of the presentation. Uh, you know, you can add me on LinkedIn, add me on Twitter, and uh, I'll see you at Transportation Camp around. Um, but I'm not going to be at the dog lunch because my dog will absolutely lose his mind if he sees a dog on the screen. Um, so thank, thank you all. I'm off to the next event, and I, I much appreciate everybody's participation and questions. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is great.